Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ala ma ba'd So inshallah today we're not going to be doing any um, aqidah We'll be studying tahara and uh, fiqh As mentioned earlier this class is divided into two subjects The first subject being aqidah, the creed of believers What Muslims are required to believe in, to be considered Muslims What belief system is required for a person to attain salvation that's something we, we started discussing on a deeper level last week. Today, inshallah, we're going to be focused more on practical issues. One of the things we learned in last week's lesson is that Islam is the implementation of our beliefs. So whatever beliefs we hold about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the implementation of that and the practical demonstration of that is called Islam. And part of the practical demonstration is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how He requires us to submit to Him. Because one can use their rationale and logic and, and, and uh, devise a system or a way or a method or a manner in which they feel like submitting to the Prophet Allah, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that method might not be the required method according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as Muslims, we need to attain knowledge on how to please Allah and how to become closer to Him and how to gain His pleasure. And in doing so, we learn about the ahkam and the rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has and, and, and the code of life, the code of living that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed for man, that Allah has revealed for man. And that code of life that Allah revealed for man has been sent through divine revelation, which is the Qur'an. Qur'an being the final revelation that Allah sent <coughs> to mankind. And the one who conveyed the Qur'an to us, brought the Qur'an to us, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who was a role model, his life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for him to live, which was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is also a source of living for man. So our code of living, our code of life, which is Sharia, comes from these two sources. Sharia comes from these two sources, that's our code of living. So if somebody asks you what does Sharia mean, Sharia means code of living. Just like Jews have their own Sharia, Christians have a Sharia too, but you know, of course, over time, they became, uh, you know, there was a separation between state and and uh, 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 state and religion. You know, so of course, you know, may, many aspects of the code of living may have been watered down. What we're talking about here is practical steps that every Muslim takes on a daily basis, and rulings and guidances pertaining to our everyday actions, our everyday practices. This is what we're going to be learning, inshallah, in this section, the fiqh section of this class. We already went through the meaning of fiqh, what fiqh means. Just a very brief definition of fiqh. Fiqh means, ma'rifatun nafsi ma laha wa ma alayha. That's the definition of fiqh. Which means, for a person to know what is due upon him and what is due for him. So this is the study of knowing what is due upon you, what is mandatory for you, what is incumbent upon you to perform, and what rights are due upon you. When it comes to the subject of the code of living, or sharia, or fiqh itself, or ahkam, which is rulings, the Qur'an contains maybe about five or six hundred verses related to ahkam. The Qur'an is moreover a book of guidance in many other different aspects. So the Qur'an doesn't, it's not a book of law. And it's not a book of law, it's a book of guidance. So one of the primary things that we are required to do as believers is to pray. As believers, we show our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through prayer. And this prayer, of course, is practiced on a ritual basis daily, five times a day. This prayer has prerequisites. And one of the prerequisites of the prayer is cleanliness. One of the prerequisites of the prayer is cleanliness. There are about seven or eight conditions that need to be met before one is able to pray. And one of them is cleanliness of the body cleanliness of the clothes and cleanliness of the place that we're praying in. I'm sure you know that already. Okay? The place you pray has to be clean, the clothes you're wearing have to be clean, and then you as a person have to be clean. Okay? So that's why it's important for us to learn the rulings of cleanliness. The rulings of cleanliness. Now, there are many different subjects related to this. One of them is the usage of water. Which types of waters can be used? We're not going to go into this subject because it's already in your text if you want to go through it. It's very detailed, the discussion. But because most of us, alhamdulillah, are very privileged and we have clean water available, as soon as we open our taps, 
that's why these, these rulings may not be relevant for us unless you end up in an area where there is no water available or very less water available and you have to kind of make ends meet or you have to then determine whether the water is clean or pure or not. Okay. So we're not going to go into that too much. But there is another scenario that sometimes we may face and that's why I want to discuss that very briefly and that is when a person comes to a point where they need to investigate. What does investigation mean? In Arabic, investigation, the term for investigation is tahabri. Tahabri. Tahabri means to investigate. What do we mean by investigation here? Say, for example, a person is faced with a situation where they have some water, but they need that water for drinking, or they need that water for making wudu. But that water is contaminated. The water is contaminated with some impurity. And what is impurity in Islam? What do we consider as impure? There's certain things that are considered impure. And impurities are of certain types. Certain impurities are dense and heavy. And certain impurities are light. From the dense and heavy impurities are the excretion of man. Okay? Whether it is um, excretion, whether it's um, urine, stool, okay, blood. This is considered a semen. This is considered impure and impure of the higher level. So if any of these impurities are contaminating the water and the water is of a very small amount, small quantity, then that water becomes impure. But what we're speaking about here is investigation. Investigation means a person is, has some water and there is a doubt that the water is contaminated and there is no strong inclination. <coughs> There is no strong inclination whether the water is contaminated or not, or how much of it is contaminated, or how much of it is contaminated. If, if the majority of it is contaminated, then what will a person do in that situation? Will they use the water for wudu? No. What will they make? What will they do instead? Tayammum, dry wudu. Tayammum, which is a substitute for wudu, is known as dry wudu, and we'll learn about the subject of. It's not plugged in. It doesn't go into that wudu. Okay. Tayammum is known as dry wudu. Okay. Now, if a person, if the water is contaminated, <coughs> if the water is contaminated, then obviously, if a person has nothing else to drink, then he has no choice. So he will, he may have to drink that water. That's a different scenario, a different situation. If he's in an area, in a place where he has no water available, and there is fear of the person dying. Okay. So this is this is basic rule. We're going to go through the text. I'm just in a nutshell explaining it to you. And then there is another situation where you may have, for example, clean clothes, and you have some impure clothes. Okay. And they're all mixed up, and you don't know which one is clean and which one is unclean. Which one is clean and which one is unclean. Okay. So if there is a stronger possibility that majority of them are clean, then go ahead and wear. Uh, then, then, then it doesn't matter in this situation whether majority are clean or majority are unclean you will go ahead and wear the clothing. Why? Because there is no substitute for clothes whereas there is a substitute for wudu. What's the substitute for wudu? Dry wudu. Is it a substitute for drinking water? No. There's no substitute for drinking water. Okay, we're talking about if you're in an area where there's no water available. So this is just a principle to keep in mind. I want you to go to page 13, the section of investigation. Okay. It says, if a set of containers, most of them being pure, but some impure, become mixed, a person must investigate before performing ablution or ritual bath. Okay. So you don't know which one is impure, which one is pure, you don't know. So you have to use your, your, uh, your um, you have to investigate, you have to guess, okay. you have to try your best to come to a conclusion. It says, if, if the pure and impure containers are equal in dry in number, dry ablution must be performed. So if they are equal, or if there are more impure, if there are equal or more impure, then a person will make dry wudu because that's a substitute. That's only for wudu. But for drinking, of course, a person won't, won't have to do this. And if you go to now page 14... Page 14, it says here, in the second to last, last paragraph, it says, If most of the containers are impure, investigation is only required for drinking, 
not for wudu because if most of them are impure, then what will happen? Then it would be considered that they will, it would be it would be considered as if all of them are impure. So a person will make dry wudu. Okay? And then at the bottom it says, as for clothes that have been mixed, a person must investigate whether the majority are pure or not. There is no substitute for clothes to cover a person's uh, uh, nakedness, whereas earth acts as a substitute for water in removing ritual impurity. Right, so that, that's very clear and very simple. We're going to move on to another chapter. So I want you to move to page 20. How is the light impurity? I mean the light... Uh, okay. So Najasa is of two types I was mentioning to you earlier. One is Najasa Valiva. Okay, so... Impurity. Impurity in Arabic is Najasa. Okay. Najasa. Okay. Najasa. And there are two types. Valiva and Khafifa. Khafifa means light. Valiva means dense, heavy. Valiva and... Khafifa. Okay, so I'm going to write Ghaliva is heavy and then light. So I'm going to read them out to you which ones are Ghaliva because there's a list. Okay. Blood, stool, urine, and semen of humans <coughs> are all Ghaliva, heavy. Okay. Intoxicating drinks to alcohol is considered Ghaliva. The excreta and urine of cats and dogs, the meat, hair, bones, and everything else of pigs, the dung of horses, donkeys, mules, cattle, <coughs> oxen, buffaloes, the droppings of goats and sheep. In other words, the excreta of all animals, whether they're halal animals or haram animals, the excreta, so that the the, um, the solids of all of those animals are considered dense, heavy type. The droppings of fowls, ducks, and wild ducks, the urine of donkeys, mules, and all animals that are considered haram. So, urine stool of all haram animals and then stool of halal animals are all considered ghalidah. Okay. So, urine of halal animals such as goats, cows, and buffaloes, and urine of horses is najasa khafifa. Khafifa means light type. And the rulings vary between Ghaliva and Khafifa, the rulings vary, that's why it's important to know this. Okay. So if you want to make a graph basically, you say that everything, everything of a human, everything of haram animals is, co is considered Ghaliva, heavy. Everything of humans, everything of haram animals is considered heavy type of impurity. And then when it comes to the um, halal animals, then their stool is impure, it, it is, the, is the heavier type, and their urine is light type. Okay, okay. so, okay, so now, now let's go to page 20, and the subject is Tahara, cleansing oneself. Okay. So, yeah. oh. Tahara is the subject, yeah? Tahara means cleanliness. Tahara means cleanliness. Cleanliness and purity. <coughs> Why is it important for us to learn about Tahara? In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, At Tahuru Shatrul Iman. Cleanliness is half of faith, or cleanliness is a part of faith. Therefore, we learn that a person needs to be in a state of purity as much as possible at all times. Now, there are certain states that a person can be in which are considered states of impurity. And this is called hadath. In Arabic, you call it hadath. A state of impurity is called hadath. Okay? I'm going to write that down. Hadath. 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 Hadith is a state of impurity. There's two types of hadith. There are two states of impurity a person can be in. 
two. Okay. One is big state, and one is small state. Okay. Akbar and Asghar. What is the first state of impurity? Big state of impurity is when a person is in the state of Janaba. What is Janaba? Janaba is when a person is in need of a bath. Janaba means when a person is in need of a bath after intercourse or after having a wet dream. For women, when, when their postnatal bleeding has ended or their menstrual cycle has ended, then they have to take a bath. They are in the state of Janaba. They are in the state of impurity. Okay, this is called Hadath Akbar, the big state where a person requires a bath to come out of that state. So Hadath Akbar, the big state of impurity, is when a person requires a bath. Okay, let's write that down. Person requires a ghusl. A ghusl is bath. Requires a ghusl. Ghusl means bath. And we're going to learn about the rulings of bath, inshallah in the next few weeks. We're going to learn about wudu first, then we're going to learn about bath. And we're going to learn what necessitates a bath. In Islam, what necessitates a bath, we'll learn that as well, inshallah. And then small is when a person requires wudu. A person requires wudu. So they don't require a bath, they clean. They clean, but they don't require a bath, but they're not in the state of wudu. So this is called small states of impurity. So when a person has used the bathroom or a person has passed wind, that is a state of small impurity. So a person needs to make wudu. Now, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, مِفْتَاحُ الْجَنَّةِ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِفْتَاحُ الصَّلَاةِ الطَّهُورِ He said the key to Jannah is prayer. And the key to prayer is cleanliness. The key to the prayer is cleanliness. So if a person wants to unlock Jannah, paradise, heaven, they have to pray. And if a person wants to unlock prayer, they want to pray, they have to be clean. So cleanliness is a means to prayer. A person can't pray without cleanliness. And in cleanliness is of a few types. One is that a person be free from the big type of hadath. And then the second one is that a person be free from the small type of hadith as well. If a person is free from the first type, but he's not free from the second type, he can't pray. Because wudu, ablution, is a requirement for prayer. <laughs> because of the verse of Quran in Surah Ma'idah, where Allah says, O oh believers, when you stand for prayer, wash your faces, your arms, including the elbows, wipe your heads, and wash your feet, including the ankles. That's a verse of Quran. And then Allah says, if you're in the state of Janaba, this first hadith, فَطَّحَّرُوا Then acquire higher cleanliness. What does higher cleanliness mean? Ba. Higher cleanliness means ba. So this is taken from the Qur'an, of course, extracted from the Qur'an. And this is how fiqh works. You might be thinking, well, why don't we just read, learn fiqh straight from hadith, straight from Qur'an? It doesn't work like that. Fiqh is extracted. Rulings are derived and extracted from the Qur'an and the Hadith. And the Fuqaha, the jurists, made life very easy for us. If we didn't have this, if we studied directly from Hadith, then it would be very difficult for us to learn, okay, what is recommended, what is required, you understand, what is, you understand, there's different levels. What is a requirement? What is Farah from this? What is Sunnah from this? What is just recommended from this? It would be difficult for a person to understand this directly from the, from the Hadith. So that's why the Fuqaha, the jurists, did a very important uh, that sister had a question first yeah. can you touch the Quran can you touch the Quran we're gonna there is a subject that's gonna come inshallah what a person can't do can do when they're in the uh, inshallah so we, we, we'll study that there inshallah but generally the, the um, consensus of the scholars is uh, that a person without wudu cannot touch the Quran person cannot touch the Quran without wudu. Okay. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you guys the importance of Tahara based on sources from, of the Quran and Sunnah. Okay. So I already mentioned to you the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah, I mentioned to you the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Now, what is the prerequisite of wudu? What is a prerequisite of wudu? Or what does a person generally do before they make wudu? Generally, they use the bathroom. And using the bathroom, of course, is a necessity of life. We all, we all use the bathroom a few times a day. So, there are rulings and ahkam and guidances in Islam pertaining to the usage of the bathroom. How does a person cleanse themselves after they have used the bathroom? And that's very important for us to learn as well. One may ask, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal guidances regarding something which is, that is natural, that a person has to do anyway? But then we see in other instances that are also natural, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed guidance. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires a person to be utmost in a state of utmost cleanliness, that is why they are ahkam revealed about this. And this is nothing to be embarrassed about. You know, once Salman Farsi anhu, somebody said to him from the from the polytheist, he was a companion of the Prophet Salman, and one of the polytheists said to him, hey, you look at your Prophet, he, he teaches you everything <laughs> to the extent that he even teaches you how to behave in the bathroom, how to use the bathroom. And he said, Yes, that's how comprehensive our deen is, that we are taught how to use the bathroom as well. So it's important that we have these guidances as well. One of the things that we should try and remember, number one, is obviously when you wake up in the morning, one of the things we learn from the hadith, which is very wise, which is a, a great act of wisdom and great teaching of wisdom from the hadith, is a person should not put their hand in water without washing it first. The first thing we should do when we wake up in the morning is to wash our hands, because we don't know whether you see pure impurity or not on the hand, the hadith t teaches us, and we should wash our hands in the morning. So this is a very uh, nice lesson from the hadith. And in fact, it says that if you, if, if water is in a, in a in a bucket, then don't dip your hands in the water, but try to get another utensil and wash your hands three times each hand. So this is a, a, a teaching that we learn from the hadith, which which have, again reinforces the element of cleanliness, which is important in Islam, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says also in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah loves those that repent in abundance and Allah loves those who are mutatahiri. And mutatahiri has a, an element, a connotation of excessive cleanliness. Not OCD, not obsessive compulsive, but excessive cleanliness. What does excessive cleanliness mean? If there is one thing that a person uses the bathroom and they just, you know, they just get out very quickly, they just use it and out and they're not very conscious about where. Uh, drops of urine may have gone or they're not conscious about clean, washing themselves properly or they're not conscious about drying themselves afterwards that's one way a person is in a rush goes into the bathroom just makes it stinja and out and then one is that a person takes their time to ensure that a person has fully relieved themselves number one because that's also important istibra that's actually something that we're going to learn now istibra that a person first relieves themselves fully then a person takes the measures that Sharia prescribes or Sharia recommends, Islam recommends, to clean themselves. Okay. And one of those measures, and then Islam also gives etiquettes of the bathroom. Okay. How a person must behave in the bathroom. Where a person can urinate, cannot urinate. Where a person shouldn't go to urinate. Okay. Because of course, now of course we have private bathrooms and we don't have a problem. Okay. There's, no, there's no issues. But back in the day it never used to be like that. Even now, in some countries, it's not like that. When I go, when I, whenever I've been in India, you're driving on the main road, you see people just, you know, sorry to mention India in that light, but you know that, and it's a city, it's a city, it's a big city, but people are just you know, on the streets because they live in in the slums, okay, so they don't have privacy, they don't have the facilities that we have, but uh, so, so that's why you know, there's a lot of rulings and. Then of course, you know, um, not to go underneath a tree, you know, we're going to learn this inshallah. You know, not to urinate under a tree, not to urinate in a hole because it might be animals, you know, creatures staying in those holes, you know, you don't want to harm them. And, uh, you know, not to, not to urinate in streams and things like that, uh, you know, Sharia teaches. And of course, other etiquettes such as not facing the Qibla while a person, the Qibla, the direction that we pray when a person is using the bathroom or not to have the back facing the Qibla uh, when a person is in the bathroom. And to also extend that to the children, not to place the children in that manner. These are all some etiquettes of the bathroom that we learn. Of course, entering with the left hand, with the dua, and not to speak in there, not to not to read Quran in there. Not, you know, things that we we learn nowadays. Of course, you know, people people go on their phones while they're in the bathroom. You know, they're 
texting away. Now they have magazines in every bathroom, you know, you know, just bathrooms people spend thousands and thousands of dollars to make it comfortable as if they want, you know, that's as if that's that's they want to, that's where they want to live, you know. So, you know, yeah, so people have TVs in their bathrooms as well because they want to be comfortable and just relax and watch a game or something. So, you know, there are etiquettes and we're going to learn those etiquettes, inshallah, hopefully in today's lesson. But number one, we have to understand is the importance of tahara. Okay? Now, when we speak about tahara, of course, there's different levels. Making wudu is also a level of cleanliness. Okay? But that comes afterwards. Before that is relieving oneself and cleansing oneself. So the term that, we, that is used in sharia and fiqh, the term that is used in, in fiqh to clean oneself is called istinja. Istinja. Okay? Somebody took my eraser. Anybody have a tissue? Yeah. You do? Yeah, there's like a lot. Thank you. It wasn't a sugar. Is it a sugar? If somebody sees it, then please just throw it in, inshallah. Li don't literally throw it. <laughs> like President George Bush got a shoe on his head. Actually, he ducks it. I don't know if I have those skills. But. Okay, so there's a few things we want to learn, okay? Stinja. Okay. Number two, istibra. And number three, istin istijma. Istijma. And number four, istinpa. Then, then, then also we have to, we're going to learn about what items can be used to cleanse oneself. What items can be used, what items cannot be used for a person to cleanse themselves. One of the things that's good to, to mention here, I think is important for us to know, is that there's instances of course when we use the bathroom and there's a method of one cleansing themselves after they've relieved themselves from the bathroom but then how about if an impurity and we mentioned the two levels of impurities either Ghaliza, Khafifa, the heavy dense type or, or the light type if those impurities are anywhere on the body how should a person remove that number one if they're on the clothes how does a person remove that okay, number two if they are not on the body or clothes, but they are on an item that cannot be squeezed, like a mattress, then how does a person clean that? So these are also other instances, and these are things that we encounter all the time. You, know, you have children, for example, and they they wet the bed. You know, children they they you, they, you know they it happens they wet the bed, or even adults. You know, you know sometimes the bed the, the bedding the the mattress can become impure. So you know, how does a person clean those? Uh, items after they have become impure. So let, let's, let's inshallah just mention that very briefly before we go into the subject of istinja. Okay. It says if, a, if impurity which can be seen, okay, because this is impurity that can't be seen. When a person is in a, in a state where they require wudu, you can't see that. Can you see that? Can you see if somebody is walking and say that person needs wudu? You can't see that. Okay. So that's a state of impurity which cannot be seen. But if there is impurity that can be seen, such as blood, urine, stool, okay, these items, it says, in najasa, impurity which can be seen, such as blood or stool, falls on the clothing, then it should be washed until the impurity is removed and no stain remains. No stain remains. So there's no fixed number of times. Okay. Unless the stain is removed after two times, then a person should do once more because of the hadith that three is the minimum for this instance. Three is the minimum. Otherwise, if after three times the impurity still remains there, you still keep it there. 
Obviously, you're going to say, well, we don't need to because we put it in the, the, the washer. Then that's fine because a washer will wash it multiple times. So there's no problem there. But just say, for instance, you have a pair of clothing, you're at work, you need to pray. That happens. Okay, you're, you start bleeding from something. You don't have a spare pair of clothes in the car or in your locker. And you need to pray Salah. What would you do in that instance? Because if, and the fuqaha, the jurists, they stipulated that if the impurity which can be seen, such as blood, urine, of the dense type, urine of human, or blood of a human, exceeds how much? One dirham. One dirham. Dirham is like what? Like if you put water in your hand, and you, and you, and you let your hands out flat, you open your hand flat, how much water would remain? Just, just this much, basically. So, if the impurity exceeds that, your prayer is not valid in those clothing. That's why a person has to wash that clothing. And of course it becomes easier to wash it if you notice it straight away and you wash it and it comes out. But if a person washes it many, 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 many times and the stain doesn't come out, but the impurity is gone, the stain is just there, then the clothes are clean. <clears throat> you try to wash it many times. But the stain, and you squeezed it, everything, you tried everything, and the stain still remains. But you washed it more than three, seven, five, seven times. Because multiple hadith about how many times you have to wash it. And after each wash, you have to squeeze it as well. So, so the impure water can drop out of the clothing. But if after many times, it still remains, the stain still remains, what will happen? Your, your clothes will be, okay, you, you can't, you, there's no other option. Yeah. Quick question. <clears throat> In the washing machine, typically there are only yeah. two cycles. And so do we have to do an extra rinse for the third cycle if you know there's something else yeah. in there? I, I don't think so because the, the, the washing machine goes round so many times, you know. The, the water stays there. It, yeah. It only rinses twice. Yeah. No, I, I think it should be okay, inshallah. But I've checked a lot of fatawa about this. And most of the scholars that I read, they say the washing machine is good enough. Right. Um, dry cleaning is a different issue. Dry cleaning is a different issue. There's, there's two sides in dry cleaning. There's fatwas on both sides. Some scholars say dry cleaning doesn't do the job. Some scholars say it does do the job. Best to be cautious. Yes. Uh, we're still rolling on uh, dog saliva, getting rid of clothes. Uh, dog saliva, that's a good one. So if dog saliva is on the clothes, then of course, again, the quantity, how much? <coughs> is it less than a dirham or more than a dirham? If it's less than a dirham, salah is valid. Okay, because it's like all other impurities, but if it's more than a dirham, then the clothes have to be washed. Does it have to be visible or uh, the saliva? You have to be certain, of course. Okay. You have to be certain that the impurity is there. If it's just a doubt that you have, then you should go with your strongest assumption. If your stronger assumption is that yes, there is impurity, then you should wash it. Last question, we're going to move on. Can we save questions till the end? Is it okay? Yes, Okay, all right. If the najasa is such that despite washing it several times, and I, I already mentioned that, if any impurity similar to urine which cannot be seen falls on the clothing, meaning like a liquid in liquid form, falls on the clothing, then it should be washed three times. Each time that it is washed, the water should be squeezed. If any impurity falls on such a thing which cannot be squeezed, such as a bed or a mattress or jewelry or utensils or bottles or shoes, then the method of purifying these things is as follows. The item should be washed once and then the person should wait. When the water stops dripping from it, it should be washed a second time. And then when the water stops dripping, then it should be washed a third time until it is purified, of course. So three times is the max. But if there still remains impurity, then you can do it a few more times as long as the impurity is, it is gone, inshallah. Uh, did, you say, <clears throat> did you say that applies to mattresses? Yeah. <clears throat> right, let's go back to the text here, it's on page 20, inshallah. Cleansing oneself is the removal of impurity with the lights of water. Okay. That's tahara, of course. What does tahara mean? Tahara means to clean oneself, to stinger, is to clean oneself from removing impurity by using water. Removal can also be attained by reducing the impurity with the likes of stones. That's what people used to use back in the day, stones, to remove impurity. I know some people are laughing, but don't ask me how it was done, I don't know. Okay. 
you go to page 20, so, okay, so let's, let's go back to these terms. Istinja, istibra, istijma, and istinqa. Okay. In a nutshell, istinja means to clean yourself after passing urine or stool. Okay. To get rid of the najasa, to get rid of the impurity by using water, this is called istinja. Istibra means that a person relieve themselves properly by means that are necessary to relieve oneself. And this is related to brothers more than sisters. Because sisters, of course, when they're relieving themselves, they'll just wait till the end. And then once, once they know they're satisfied, they'll, they'll clean themselves with water and they're done. But what happens with men is that sometimes after relieving themselves from urine, there's still some drops of urine that could drop after they get up. If they walk a few steps and still drops of urine could be dripping. So that's why istibra is important for men. This is more related to men. So we're going to learn about istibra in the next uh, paragraph or so. Number three, istijma. Can anyone tell me what istijma means? I'm going to give you a clue. You know jima. What's jima? Who's been for hajj here? Jamarat, jima. Ramiul Jima, throwing this pel pel So istijma actually means using stones. Okay? And what's, what's actually a substitute for using stone or what? Tissue paper, toilet paper, okay? toilet paper. And the reason why they used to use stones is because stone has the ability to absorb. Okay? So they used to use stones. Obviously tissue paper does the same work. It has the ability to absorb the impurity and take it out fully. So this is called istijma. And then number four is istinqa. Istinqa is a higher level which means to dry oneself, to dry yourself after you um, relieve, relieve yourself and, and gone through these other steps. So, a man must clear his front orifice until all trace of urine has stopped. The aim is to clear the front orifice of any trace of dripping. That's very obvious. The traces of urine are only regarded as having stopped when wetness no longer appears on a stone placed on the front orifice or tissue paper. How would a person know if they've, they've completely relieved themselves of urine by placing tissue paper near the area and seeing whether it still absorbs any more? Yeah. And if, if it doesn't, then of course a person has completed the, 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 um, the relieved themselves, then they can go ahead and wash themselves. A woman does not need to do this, she is merely required to wait a little and then cleanse herself because of course the biological differences between men and women. Okay. Now, istibra, what, was, what we mentioned here, is what we're talking about. Istibra. Istibra can be attained by a few things. Sometimes people like to cough when they're in the bathroom, so that by coughing they fully relieve uh, all the droppings that they had or may have had could, could come out. Some of the ways the fuqaha write is something by walking, for example, because what happens if a person stands up after relieving themselves and they haven't fully relieved themselves and they start making wudu and drops come out, then the wudu won't be valid because it's impure, because you've urinated after while you're making your wudu basically, you're still urinating. Therefore, that's why istibra is very important for men. So it says here, for a man clearing the orifice, Istibra basically can be completed in any manner normal to him. This may include walking. So, by how would a person walk and attain this? By of course placing tissue paper, you know, in, in that area, so it obviously doesn't soil a person's clothes. Otherwise, if the clothes are soiled, then it could be problematic to pray in those clothing. This may include walking, clearing the throat, inclining to the left side, inclining to the left side, and there's some medical benefits to this as well. There's some medical benefits to this as well, actually. <coughs> Striking the ground with the feet or gently squeezing the, the area. The manner of clearing the orifice is not restricted to any one way because of the difference in the way people do this. So, obviously, so here's a fourth paragraph. Beginning wudu, like I was mentioning to you a couple of minutes ago, <coughs> beginning wudu is not valid until a person is satisfied that the dripping of urine has completely come to an end. It's completely stopped. Any wetness that reappears at the head of the, the private area is considered the same as flowing urine. Thus, this prevents subsequent ablution from being valid. That's very obvious. 
don't need, doesn't require any explanation. Now, what is the ruling for this first one, istinja? What's the ruling for it? The ruling for it is that it's sunnah. It is sunnah as long as it does not soil any other part of the body. If a person relieved themselves, whether from the front or the back orifice, and that did not spread on the body, it did not spread on the body at all, then to make istinja by washing is only a sunnah. Not only is it a sunnah in a, in a derogatory manner, but it's sunnah. The ruling of it is that it's sunnah. If it spreads, <coughs> if it spreads and is most likely to spread, then obviously a person has to wash it. Then it becomes wajib for a person to wash it. So that's why it says here, cleansing oneself is an emphasized sunnah for both men and women. And it, as it was regularly performed by the Prophet, peace be upon him. However, it is not necessary because he did leave it on occasion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, whoever cleanses oneself should do so an odd number of times. Whoever does so has done well. Whoever does not, there is no harm. This is when the impurity has not spread. If the impurity has spread, then the ruling is different. So let's go to the next page 22. On the next, just the next side. Page 22 says, cleansing oneself only applies to impurity. So if a person passes wind, for example, wind itself isn't considered impure in filth. So if a person passes wind, they don't have to go to the bathroom and start washing themselves. That's basically what they're saying. Only if a person passes impurity, then the washing comes. <coughs> If either the front or rear orifice is touched by an impurity from an external source, even if it be pus or blood emanating from the veins, cleansing oneself purifies the orifice. Cleansing oneself with water. Okay. Next paragraph. Cleansing oneself is only sunnah if the impurity does not spread across the rear orifice. However, if it does spread across the orifice and is the size of a... Dirham, as I was mentioning to you earlier, so a dirham is like a quarter, okay, size of a quarter, and it spread, and it, 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 it is it is more than the size of a quarter. It is no longer considered as cleansing oneself. It is now necessary to remove the impurity. It is now necessary to remove the impurity with water or a liquid. The action now falling under the category of the removal of an impurity, as opposed to the cleansing of oneself. So there's a difference between cleansing oneself and removing an impurity. There's a difference between cleansing oneself and removing an impurity. So what we're saying here is cleansing oneself is recommended if it does not soil any of the orifice. If it soils an orifice, then you have to remove that impurity. Yeah. And now it becomes incumbent and compulsory. What does the liquid mean? It says water or liquid. A, a, clean, a, a clean liquid. Something that, that is not other than water that, that is used, that may be used. What, what, what? Well, I don't know if there's anything, <laughs> anything you can use right now that's, that would be a substitute for water, I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't think anything really. But just giving an example, if a person didn't have water and there was something else like juice or something, for example. You can't. Generally you can't. Okay, generally you can't, but if there is no water then you would. Yes. Could it be like baby wax or something like that? Is there a pure, like, like, well, baby wipes is not really a liquid, it's, it's a... But it has some kind of... Yeah, 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 yeah. But it will do the job, you know, like, when we clean children. Okay. So, removal of an impurity can only be done with water, whereas cleansing oneself can also be done with stones. So that's why we're making this distinction here. If a person use the bathroom and neither of the orifices were soiled, it didn't spread, then it's sufficient for a person to just use stones or use tissue. But if it spreads, now you have to remove that impurity. You can't just use stones or you can't just use tissue, but you have to use water. So it's absolutely essential to use water because removal of impurity cannot take place with just stones. It doesn't remove the impurity properly. So you see, you see the difference, okay? Does everybody understand that difference? Yes? Okay, right.
if you don't, then speak up, inshallah, I'll explain it again. Okay. If the impurity that has spread is more than the weight of a quarter, let's say a quarter is sort of a dirham, and is a solid, or the size of a quarter, and is a liquid, it is obligatory for it to be washed away either with water or liquid. So I already mentioned that it's obligatory if it's more than a quarter, or if it's the size of a quarter. It is obligatory to wash any impurity in their rare orifice when performing a ritual bath from sexual impurity, menstruation, or postnatal bleeding with absolute water, even if the impurity be small, so as to fulfill the obligatory washing of ritual impurity. Okay. What does that mean? Ghusl. Ghusl. We mentioned that there are certain instances when a person has to make ghusl. One of them is when a person has been <coughs> active with their spouse, for example, or a person is experiencing their, 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 their menstrual cycle, has, a woman's menstrual cycle has ended, or her postnatal bleeding, her nifas, has ended. Now she has to take a bath, and she can only remove, if there were any impurities on the body, it doesn't matter how small, even if it's less than a dirham, she has to use water, because that's the requirement for a ritual bath. The requirement for a ritual bath is using water. It is sunnah to cleanse oneself with a cleansing stone, neither so rough as to cause damage, nor so smooth as to not allow cleansing. Because cleansing is the aim, of course. So it says here, sim something similar to a cleansing stone may also be used. It must be pure, not valuable or respected. So a person can't use like a silk handkerchief. That's respected, that's, that, that's valuable. Also, by using absolute water, the sunnah is established in the most comprehensive. Okay, it says here, washing with absolute water. What does absolute water mean? Water. There's no other possibility of it being anything else. Water. Washing with absolute water is the highest level of purity that a person can attain. Okay. By using absolute water, the sunnah is established in the most comprehensive manner. Using stones merely reduces the amount of impurity present whilst there is a difference of opinion over using other than absolute water for purification. That's, that's our discussion about liquids, basically. Okay. Now, what is the best method? The best method is to first use tissue paper, then to use water. This is the best method in all ages. Even in the Prophet time, people would use stones, then water. Not to just suffice on one, but to use both. And this is what Allah Ta'ala praised the people of Quba. You know the verse, Inna Allah yuhibbu al-tawabeen wa yuhibbu al-mutatahhireen wa la masjidun ussisa ala al-taqwa fi awwali yawmin haqqa an taquma In Surah Al-Tawbah, there is a verse regarding the people of Quba. Because the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they built another masjid called Masjid Dirar. Allah Ta'ala called it Masjid Dirar. Okay. And that masjid was built on, the hypocrites masjid was built on misguidance and falsehood. Okay, deviants. Whereas the people of Quba that were praying in the Masjid Quba, they were pure people, good people. And Allah Ta'ala praised them for their cleanliness. Allah says, فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَّرُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَّهِّرِينَ Allah says, in this Masjid, in Quba, there are men that love to stay clean. And that's a very comprehensive term because cleanliness could also mean internal cleanliness, clean hearts. <coughs> but it also means very clean because it was explained that these people not only used to suffice on water but they would use stones and then water as well to attain utmost purity and Allah Ta'ala loved that quality of this and if you notice in the Quran when Allah speaks about the mutatahirin or the clean, clean people he doesn't call them tahirin he calls them mutatahirin there's a difference between tahirin and mutatahirin tahirin with just three base letters tahara okay, from in the thulathi mujarra trilateral uh, verb form means to be clean but when you take it into the 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 the, the extra tatahur not just tahara but tatahara with an extra letter it means that they exaggerate in cleanliness they're extremely clean Allah likes it when a person goes the extra mile basically to attain purity but not obsessive compulsive again we have to make that clear because some people when they read the subjects of tahara in Islam they start becoming very obsessive compulsive. They start to, when they go to the bathroom, they start washing themselves ten times. They start using five, ten lodas. 
and your your family will realize when your water bill goes up. Yeah. You, you've been using too many lotas. Lota is the uh, you know the jug, the water jug, the water can. That people use. You can get it from any desi store. The water can. And you get metal ones. You get plastic ones. Yeah. People have different preferences. You can go to Home Depot and get a um, you know flower, flower jug, flower, flower. Yeah. Right. So obviously it's good to use water and to, to be satisfied. That's the aim. The aim is to be satisfied that a person is clean, but a person should not become obsessive. But some people suffer from a, a problem which is called awham, waswasa, waham, waham, and the period is awham, where they have this um, paranoia. I'm not clean, I'm not clean, I'm not clean, I'm not clean, I'm not clean. So they continue washing, continue washing, continue washing. Well, because of course in, in wudu, the areas that have to be washed in wudu, for example, have to be washed. Not even one hair can be left dry, so they become paranoid about that. So they keep washing to make sure it's washed. Keep washing, keep washing, keep washing. But to go above three times is against the sunnah. The sunnah is three times. So if a person is suffering from this, then they have to just... The, the best way to, to, to remove themselves from this, from this problem, it is a problem. I've seen, I've met people in my life who suffer from this. A few people. And um, the best way is to, is to just console them and tell them that you're fine. Allah likes you how you are. You're alright. You're clean, inshallah. And even if you're not clean, Allah will accept your prayers. And that, that's the way that you have to come from. <coughs> Otherwise, it, there are people that suffer from this, and they suffer their entire lives. Okay? For example, um, pronouncing things with the correct tajweed. Some people become very obsessive about it. They think they've said it wrong, so they'll repeat the dua again and again. They'll finish eating and they'll say, they keep repeating. It's a problem. It's a sickness. We need to get rid of it. And this is a waswasa of shaitan. Shaitan, he whispered, he says, yeah, it's not right, you haven't done it properly. It's not right, it's not right, it's not right. He keeps doing it. So we have to defeat, inshallah. Not allow this to happen. Now, the best method, as we mentioned already, in all ages is to wipe and then wash. In that order. Not wash and then wipe. Wipe, then wash. And of course, after one has washed, then you can wipe again to dry yourself before putting on your clothes. Hence, first the impurity coming out from the orifice is wiped away, then the orifice is washed, and Allah has praised the people of Quba for washing, like I just mentioned to you, for washing with water after having used stones. Thus, using both is a sunnah in all ages according to the correct position, which is the fatwa. Well, fatwa alayhi. It is valid to use water alone as well. So, if a person doesn't have any toilet paper or stones or whatever they want to use, it is valid to use water alone. This is second to using both water and stones in preference, as we already mentioned. And to use stones alone is the least preferable. The sunnah is attained by this as the ultimate purpose is achieved, although the most preferable method carries the most reward. But of course, as we already mentioned earlier, that if any of the part of the body is soiled by the impurity, then water has to be used to remove that. Stones will not remove that impurity. Or well, it's all about cleansing oneself. This is all about cleansing oneself. Now, how many tissue papers should be used? How many stones should be used? It's recommended to use three stones because of the Prophet's statement. Whoever cleanses oneself should do so an odd number of times. So one, three, five. This tradition indicates permissibility as opposed to necessity. Rasulullah what did he say? He said, if one wishes to, which means it's not necessity, it's a permissibility, it's just a recommendation. <coughs> so it's not necessary to use stones or to use tissue paper, but it's a recommendation. The number is recommended and not an emphasized sunnah. The tradition continues further and is conclusive in providing an option by his statement upon him, be peace. Whoever cleanses oneself should do so an odd number of times. Whoever does so has done well, but whoever does not, there is no harm. Page 24. The aim of cleansing oneself is to cleanse the orifice as thoroughly as possible. That's the aim. The recommended manner mentioned below is preferred because cleanliness is attained in the most comprehensive manner. So now what you will find is fuqaha, jurists, will go into great detail about how a person should attain this purity. So obviously we learned from the sunnah. What did we learn? That for a person to combine between yeah, stones or toilet paper, and water is the preferred thing. 
Mm. If a person doesn't have toilet paper, water is the second. If a person doesn't have any of those two, then to use stones or toilet paper is the third, or at least the third. <coughs> and we also learned that an odd number of tissue paper should be used or stones should be used. Okay. That's the, the aim now is to thoroughly cleanse oneself. That's the aim. That's the whole objective. But now the Fuqaha goes into great detail about how a person must attain this. Where should they start from? Okay. Should they start from the back or the front? So if they're wiping the, the back orifice, should they start from the front or the back? Or the back or the front? And depending on the season, depending on the person's, you know, for a man, whether his <coughs> private area is sagging or not sagging, depending on, of course, the climate, whether he's feeling hot or cold, so that the, 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 the front area does not get soiled if he goes from back to front. You know, all of these things the Fuqa have mentioned. Then, when washing oneself, how many fingers should be used? Obviously, what we learn is that a person has to use their left hand. That's established. That's established. Now, how many fingers should one use? The Fuqa have gone into detail again. Which fingers should a person use? The middle one with the, with the ring finger and the little finger. They say, should you use just one? You know, so they go into these details. I don't think it's necessary for us to go into too much detail about it. If you want to, you can go over that, inshallah. Okay. If you go to the next page, page 25, then it says, the following are less strong positions. Someone afflicted with constant doubt should limit the washing to seven or three times, as I was mentioning, if a person is in doubt all the time. Three times for the front orifice and five times for the rear orifice, nine times, ten times. These are just different opinions that the Fuqaha, the juries have mentioned. So says here, whilst cleansing oneself, the person should strive to loosen the rear orifice so that as much impurity as possible can be removed from the back area, provided one is not fasting. The person fasting, however, should not do so to prevent the fast from being coming in value. Because if a person tries to attempt to loosen the, the back area when a person is fasting, they may insert a finger or water might go up there or something like that, and, and you have to avoid them when, when you're fasting. That's why they say, don't attempt to do that while you're fasting. Like it mentions here, likewise the person fasting should avoid inserting a wet finger because it invalidates the fast. Let's go into section 6, etiquettes of cleaning oneself. What are the etiquettes of cleaning oneself? And by the way, I, I know it seems like we might be rushing through, rushing through pages, but we've got a lot of content to cover in a space of six months. So a lot of times it's good for you to just read over it before you come or read over it after you've left the classroom, inshallah. Etiquettes of cleaning, cleansing oneself. It is not permitted to expose. Now, these are some of the rulings. Where should a person use the bathroom? If a person goes to public restrooms, especially men, try best not to use urinals, of course, for many reasons, multiple reasons. Number one, it's not recommended to stand up and urinate. Okay. Number two, somebody else, you, you could be exposing your nakedness and your aura to other people. So this is, this is something that is unlawful for us to do. If you're using the bathroom, the etiquette, co common courtesy is very important if you're using a public bathroom to wash the seat, wipe it first. Get some wet, wet tissue paper, wipe it until you're satisfied that it's clean, and then you know, sit on it. Because obviously people stand up, they don't have the same etiquette that we do, same values that we have when it comes to using bathrooms, and the bathrooms are usually very, very dirty when you go there. And we don't even need to talk about people outside, even in the masjid. Okay? You go to the masjid sometime and you use a bathroom in the masjid and you see the toilet seat is wet. And it's and it's actually urine, you know, because children use it as well and they don't they don't ra they don't raise the, the, the toilet seat, they stand up and urinate. They don't they don't clean it. So it's important for us to make sure it's clean before we start using it. Best to just use the bathrooms at home. Unless you're working here and you have to be here for five hours straight, <laughs> then it's different. Okay. The person by the way, it's nice to have staff toilets. If anybody from the board is here, <laughs> wants to have staff toilet, inshallah, it would be very nice. Likewise, the first. Okay. <laughs> Likewise, the person the fasting should have. You know, I think this guy is an absolute diva. We've had employees here for 20 years, and he never. They never asked for their own bathroom. So this guy's been here for six months, and he's asking for a bathroom. <laughs> What's he going to ask for next? Likewise, the person fasting should have worked. There's an imam in Dallas who's been there for 25, 30 years, Imam Yusuf. And you know, we were having construction in our masjid in Plano when I was in Plano, and he was in Richardson. Imam Yusuf said to me, during the construction, he goes, did you ask for your own toilet? I said, no. He goes, you have to. I said, why? He goes, because you need to have your own toilet. <laughs>